Maximize Your Influence is your podcast for the latest persuasion, sales, and negotiation techniques. Our mission is to help you influence on command, anyone, anytime, anywhere. Your host is the author of Persuasion IQ, Laws of Charisma, and the best-selling book, Maximum Influence. Now, your host, Kurt Mortensen. This is where we start podcast 481. Maximize your influence. Kurt Mortensen here. So really, are you a charismatic, engaging, influential person? Are you a psychopath? Are you overlapping? You might be surprised here what we'll be talking about. Welcome back. Good to have you here. Tell your family, friends, and enemies about the podcast. Do appreciate it. Hit like, subscribe, give us some feedback. Anything you want me to put on the show, Kurt, K-U-R-T at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. But you can find us at iTunes, Spotify, Google, iHeart, and YouTube under Maximize Your Influence. So, hey, let's get into the persuasion blinja. Don't, don't, don't. Of course, hopefully you know that's a, either a blunder or a ninja, a little bit of both. You get to decide. So I was invited to go to a high-end steak restaurant. It's one of my favorite places. It was a favor due, so they were picking up the bill. A much younger couple. But you have to understand, when you go to a high-end restaurant, your expectations are very high. And I bought a high-end car in the past, and my expectations were so high that I really didn't like it. Now, it was a good car. If my expectations would have been low, or sorry for my friends who live in Pittsburgh, when people go to Pittsburgh, it's a beautiful city, but their expectations are so low, they really love it because it's an incredibly beautiful city. So... I don't know if you take that as a compliment or an offense, but you have to manage those expectations. So if you're going to run something that's high end, you better be high end. That includes the service. That includes keeping the appointments. So everything was good. The parking, the ambiance. They took us five minutes early to our reservation. The server was very friendly, very professional. Although the first little blunder there is they are focusing on me. I'm not paying the bill. But, you know, I guess I was the one they pegged as the one in charge. You're going to pay the bill and make the decisions. That wasn't truth. But anyway, here come out the steaks. There were six of us in the party, and five of the steaks weren't done right. All right, let's send them back. And a couple more did okay on the way back, but then there's another two or three that, um, no, they weren't even cooked a little bit more. They were still way too raw, not ready to eat, so send them back again. And then a couple more came back to the air, okay, but there was one person in the party that sent it back four times. Now, part of us thinks, well, you're just being picky, but the waiter was agreeing. So I don't know what's going on in the back room, but obviously expectations. So what do you do? They finally got it right. And what's the big lesson here? You blow it, you make it right. And they comped the steak. They apologized profusely. The manager came over. And then they comped everyone dessert. All right, now you're speaking my language, making it right. And that's another lesson. I've had 10, 20, 30 good experiences before that, so I'm willing to be a little forgiving. And then the bill came and they gave it to me, <laughs> which insulted the people that were supposed to pay the bill. And so that didn't help at all. So combinations of some blunders and some... Ninjas try to make it right and then blowing it at the very end. You have to be so careful as expectations. If you prejudge, let's say you're right 80% of the time, good for you. It's that 20% you're missing. When you prejudge, not only do you insult people, but it sucks the life out of your presentation, especially when you prejudge, oh, they're not going to buy, they're not going to do it, they're not going to be interested. You're just going through the motions and so they're not going to do it anyway. Hey, put your whole heart and soul into it. A, it's great practice. B, they might do it. C, they probably know somebody who would be interested. That is just reality. All right, let's dive into our geeky Scarly article. So this goes with the topic. This is Larry from Vegas wanting to know the similarities and differences between being a psychopath and somebody that's very charismatic. As you know, I love charisma. I've been studying it a long time. So I found this article. We'll kick off with this. This is Dr. Pogosian, Psychology Today, and a few quotes out of Harvard Business Review and the Academy of Management. People tend to ask me quite a bit when I train on this topic of charisma, is it a gift or can it be trained? And the answer is yes, you can learn how to do it. Some of these skills and traits you already have, some you can learn. 
Again, nature, nurture, a little bit of both. You can also learn a few of these things. Because you see that person could be a politician, a friend, a manager, someone you look up to. That was just their presence. You want to be around them. You want to be influenced by them. And that's the key with charisma. You want to be influenced by them. You want to recruit others to be influenced by them. So is it their looks, their talks, their personality, accomplishments, attitudes, all of the above? And Dr. John Atanicus from the University of Luzon says charisma can be learned. It's not this secret, sacred, special reservation for special people, we can boost our charisma levels, he says. There's a few things that we can do, and I want to talk about some of those. And I promise you, I agree 100%, you can be more charismatic. It's not something that you're born with. You might be born with some inherent traits that you can magnify. It might be easier for you, but you can learn and magnify these skills. I've been doing this for a long time. So he puts them into two categories. I use four, but he'll talk about his two. He talks about the verbal. And I agree 100% here that leaders use more metaphors, similes, analogies, anecdotes than the average person. Studies are clear on that. Also, the ability to tell a story and inspire with stories and engage with stories, absolutely. They use more questions and they help people not only set, but keep high goals. Then he talks about others. These would be combination of verbals, nonverbals, animated voice. I call it vocal variety. Facial expressions, gestures, your presentation skills is all part of being charismatic. So being a charismatic presenter, you can do that. Let me add to that. When you talk about your voice, it's more than just that. It's the rate. It's reducing your vocal fillers. It's adjusting your volume and a variety of things like that that you can work on. And so my big picture, we talk about charisma. Yes, I agree 100% it can be learned. Number two, you should learn it. Number C, let's learn it. Let's let's master this. You've got this. You could do this. So part of charisma, the way I see it, researching laws of charisma, is your presence. What do you radiate? Your passion, your confidence, your optimism. Are you bringing up the energy in the room? Are you sucking it out? Even happiness and humor. Then, of course, there's inner charisma. A lot of people don't talk about that because if you can't influence yourself, you can't influence other people. Self-discipline, intuition, and courage, your ability to focus is all part of that. And then as I talked about your presentation skills, can you speak with conviction? Do you have the people skills, the stories we talked about? Are you a good listener? Can you develop rapport? And another one, your ability to empower others. Can you inspire? Do you have credibility? Can you motivate? Can you build a vision that people can buy into and want to be a part of? That's all part of the process. So agree with this article. It also goes into, does charisma travel across cultures? Yeah. I mean, there's some differences. We have to adapt by culture whenever we influence or we talk about charisma. Let me add to that, too, is what about time? Hitler was considered very charismatic at his time. I don't think he'd be very charismatic today. John F. Kennedy was considered very charismatic. I don't think if you watch his presentation, he was come across as charismatic today as he was back then. Not good or bad, just reality. We've changed, and so we have to change a few things when we talk about charisma. It's not static through the ages. I want to go into the biggest misconceptions about charisma. This will help us out as we get into, okay, are you a psychopath or are you charismatic? He said there was a flawed study out there that humility is more important than charisma in a company performance. He says, no, false, not true. Humility is a good thing, but charisma does make a difference, not only in performance, but in motivation. And I'm going to add to that too. I've seen the research on retention. He talked about the, as I mentioned before, the Hitler problem that charisma's earned a bad name. Well, just with sales and persuasion and influence and management, yeah, a lot of bad people that have blown up before you. He says charisma is not correlated with being an arrogant bastard, (laughs) although some people make that correlation. But look at the great ones like Gandhi, Martin Luther King. Look at the religious leaders that have lasted over time. Max Smith is, well, it's not that big of a deal. He says, totally untrue. Dr. Atticaitis asserts, our research shows that not only charisma can increase worker performance as much as monetary bonuses, but charisma can also explain who wins elections and who tweets or TED Talks go viral. Yes, off the charts, very important. You can learn and master these skills. And the big part here too is, are you just looking for short-term persuasion or sale. You're looking for long-term leadership, charisma. There's a difference in the techniques. One and done 
And maybe if your product's just quick done, they'll never see you again, maybe. But usually you want to build long-term relationships, and that's going to be a big difference as we get into the differences between being a psychopath and being charismatic. So let's get into our daily topic. Hmm. So first of all, before I dive into it, we know when people are around charismatic people, let's say in the workplace, they love coming to work, they work longer hours, they increase motivation, higher retention, higher levels of trust, more loyal, and they felt more meaningfulness at work. You're basically getting more out of people. Most people admit they're not very motivated and they can do a lot more. When you're charismatic, people hit that grindstone, they put in longer hours, and that's the difference. So what are the definitions? Well, charisma connects you with somebody physically, emotionally, intellectually. I love the definition from Jerry Spence that charisma is the passing of our pure energy to the other person. And my definition, as I mentioned, is charisma is getting others to want to do what you want them to do, and they're excited to do it, and they're recruiting others at the same time. So we have these two traits, charisma and being a psychopath. They are really two distinct personality traits, but there are some overlaps, some similarities that we should be talking about. So let's talk about some similarities and differences here to see if you cross the line as a certified psychopath. The first one is that charm, that rapport, your likability. That is a definite similarity between the two. Both psychopaths, and if you've seen some of these psychopaths that have been murderers, they can approach almost anybody. They were likable. They had a good smile. Many people thought they were good people. That's the overlap, that charm, that rapport, positive first impressions. They do really well in social situations. That's what they both have in common. The other one, both very influential. Charismatic leaders can motivate and influence to get what they want. Psychopaths exploit, deceive for personal gain. So both influential One's doing it for the short term, one's doing it for the long term. So, psychopaths, manipulation, deceit. Whatever they can do to exploit others for personal gain is winning the game. Also, they come across as empathetic. See, charismatic people do possess high levels of empathy. That is important with charisma. Research does show that. But a charismatic person is sincere, is truly empathetic. A psychopath can just fake it. They can fake emotions to manipulate to deceive others, to pretend that they're caring about other people's emotions and they couldn't care less. They don't have that on their radar. They're not able to do that. They've done studies where, okay, if you kill one person to save five, that's okay to an empathetic person. Well, no, what can we do to save them all? Psychopath, oh, that, that's fair. That's, those are good numbers. When a charismatic person says, I like you, I care about you, they mean it. It's real. You can feel it. You can feel it from a psychopath too, but to internally on a psychopath, I care about you has the same meaning as, hey, pass the salt, pass the bread. There's nothing there. That's not how they're programmed. So it's kind of hard to understand them sometimes. There's nothing there. That's why we find out psychopaths have been killing animals. Nothing there. Didn't phase them. They didn't care. There's, There's no feeling. So even though they both come across as having feeling, having empathy, one is real and one is just to manipulate. Another one is they both lead to change. Charismatic leaders leave positive, lasting impact on the organization communities. They're breeding others to take their places. They inspire loyalty, cooperation. They get more productivity. Psychopaths who are in the same positions of power, no, it's them, all of them. They're not grooming anybody, mostly politicians. And you'd be surprised how many politicians have psychopathic tendencies. Kind of scary. (laughs) Let me know if you want to hear more about that. But they tend to cause more chaos and harm, and I'll say craziness and uneasiness. And it leads others to make bad decisions, unethical decisions, to harm others. There's damage to everyone's relationships. So there's change. One's a lot more positive. One is a lot more negative. But there's a big piece there. I hope you caught that. True charismatic leaders are grooming people to place them. And people are learning and growing from them. With a psychopath, no. They're always the leader, always going to be the leader. No one's going to take their place. And if you are threatening to take their place, man, you are out. You better start hiding. So a lot of it comes back to intent, right? Charismatic leaders want to lead and inspire, make a positive impact. Again, psychopaths, you look at them, self-interest. What can I gain? 
It's okay to step on people. It's almost kind of fun for them to step on people, to take advantage of people. They're the dumb ones. I won, you lost. So if I need to exploit or deceive or manipulate to get something that I want, to benefit from something, that is fun. That's okay. That is a huge difference between the two. So there's some overlap there is. And let me add another big difference is when you look at charismatic people, they do tend, for the most part, have healthy social relationships. They're well-liked. People like to be around them. Again, remember, psychopaths are more for the short term. Struggle with those long-term relationships because they manipulate, they step on people. People eventually see that fake empathy. And people start to see those darker thoughts, maybe those darker intentions. Now, let's continue on. Again, it's so interesting. A lot of politicians and even CEOs of large companies are psychopaths. You don't have to be a murderer to be a psychopath. So let's go into what it takes to be a psychopath and why they're so successful. Not that I want you to do these things, but to be aware of the people around you. Again, I could label off a lot of politicians that have been labeled as psychopaths, and they're probably some of your favorites. So Psychology Today did an article on qualities that make some psychopaths so successful, and their big piece, which overlaps on today's topic, is its charisma. So they did a little research with Bruce Mars and the Journal of Research of Personality, and they argue that there are higher levels of charisma in psychopaths, and that makes them more successful. And my analogy here, tell me if it's a good or bad one, it's like frosting on a rock. (laughs) If you made a rock look like a cake, beautiful frosting, beautiful decorations, but it's still a rock. Charismatic people, it's really a cake on the inside. It's going to taste good. We all are going to enjoy it, but to a psychopath, it still looks good. But when you start cutting through the frosting, that initial first impression or the initial project that you're working on, you realize, yeah, this is a rock. So they found that psychopaths were good at the influencing others. And I'll say probably for the short term, but it was that long term getting along with others and making people feel uncomfortable when they realized there was a rock under the frosting. Let me quote him. He goes on to say, you may enjoy being around psychopaths because of their charm, confidence, and fearlessness. However, those in close contact with psychopathic individuals are also at risk for being exploited, manipulated, lied to, cheated on, or even abandoned once the charismatic psychopath, there's your word of the day, charismatic psychopath gets what they want or becomes bored. Tend to have a very short focus or attention span. So to finish up, how do we spot this psychopath? How do we know? When we see a lot of frosting out there, how do we know that there, there's a rock inside or a piece of trash? Well, eventually you're going to see that lack of empathy, lack of remorse. There's no moral conscience. They don't feel it. It's okay to step on people. It's okay to ruin people. It's okay to win the game. It doesn't phase them. To the average person, it's like, you know, we probably shouldn't do that. They have a conscience. Psychopaths don't have a conscience. Remember, for a psychopath, they'll have charm. They'll come across as charismatic, but once they get what they want, you're going to see that they don't care about you anymore. That charm is gone. And they also have this inflated self-image. Psychopaths, they see themselves as more important and deserving than others that they're above the rules, above the norms that most of us follow. They're pathological liars. Doesn't phase them. It's okay to deceive. The ultimate goal that benefits them it makes it okay. Now, they might bring you into the inner circle and pretend that they're going to help you out too, but once they get what they need from you, then you're out of the circle and probably out on the street. You'll see a lack of remorse or guilt for the things that they do. You'll see shallow emotional responsive. If there's a tragedy in the city, in the country, like you can tell that, oh, okay, whatever. Those things happen. Let's move on. And you can see the difference. So now you know. Are you a charismatic, influential leader? Or are you a charismatic, manipulative psychopath? <laughs> You'd be surprised how many people around you have psychopathic traits that you need to be careful of and just kind of gauge, step back. All right, are they truly charismatic? They have good intent. They're there to serve and help people. Or look out, they're stepping on people. They're going to get what they want no matter what. So there we have it. Larry, you get the gold version of InfluenceUniversity.com. Thanks for sending it in. You guys know the email address. Everything you need is at MaximizeYourInfluence.com. The links to these articles, the archives of the podcast, your free Persuasion IQ assessment, advanced training materials, information on coaching, influenceuniversity.com. It's all there. Check it out. 
Also, you can check out the special of the week. Click it on the link, Podcast 481. You want to be more charismatic? Take over 50% off on the Power of Charisma, the program that will teach you to become more charismatic and more powerful, not more psychopathic. (laughs) Check it out. Tell your family and friends and enemies about the podcast. Do appreciate it. Take something that you've learned today or maybe something that piqued your interest and start working on it, fine-tuning it, changing it. Become more charismatic. Become more influential. Become a better person and go out and persuade with power. 